There's no need to get tense. Relax with Flux Condenser. Subscribe, baby, subscribe. I've known about Macintosh audio equipment since I was a teenager in the 80s, but until recently never considered owning their equipment. When I was younger, not only could I not afford Macintosh, but the old-fashioned look of their components never really appealed to me. And as I got older and could actually afford the gear, I still hadn't learned to appreciate their styling and favored the more modern-looking offerings from Lexicon and others. Now that I'm in my 50s, though, and have picked up the hobby of electronics repair, I've become more interested in vintage audio equipment. There are many great vintage components, but among the most collectible are those from Macintosh. There are a couple of reasons for this. First, Macintosh has always meant quality. Nowadays, we take for granted that most name brand audio components perform well at a good price. In the early days of hi-fi, though, the differences between competing components could be stark, and you really did need to spend more to get more. Macintosh equipment was expensive, but performed to a high standard that more than matched the strictest criteria for high fidelity. And during the 60s and early 70s, Macintosh enjoyed a heyday period when discerning audiophiles who wanted the best would do well to seriously consider the brand. Heydays don't last forever though, and as more affordable, high-performance audio gear from Japan flooded the market in the mid-70s and beyond, paying two, three, or four times the cost for Macintosh equipment no longer ensured a matching multiple in performance. Instead of trying to compete with the Japanese on price though, Macintosh made the wise decision to just keep doing what they always had, make premium, handcrafted, made-in-USA audio components. That path has sometimes been rocky, but it's allowed Macintosh to survive as many American competitors faded away. Today, Macintosh still makes quality gear that looks very much like its products from the 60s and 70s. That's because Macintosh not only didn't compete with the Japanese on price, they also wisely decided not to compete with them on looks. In the 80s and 90s, that look didn't appeal much to younger buyers like me, but most of us couldn't afford the equipment anyway. Older generations with more disposable income, however, appreciated the professional, conservative styling. As time went on and Macintosh kept their classic look alive, their vintage equipment was able to age gracefully cosmetically, contributing greatly to its resale value and collectability. Porsche takes a similar approach with design, which also helps maintain the value of their vehicles. Macintosh is American, not German, but in some ways I consider them the Porsche of the audio world. Maybe not the flashiest or most exotic, but expensive, timeless looking, and great performing. You'd be forgiven if you thought Macintosh Audio was the same brand as the computers sold by Apple. But while both are American, Apple designs computers in California, and Macintosh designs audio equipment in Binghamton, New York. They are two distinctly separate companies. In fact, Macintosh Audio has been making equipment since 1949, far earlier than Apple has been making Macintosh computers. Steve Jobs reached out to Macintosh in 1982 for permission to use the name, which they allowed. But Apple had to change the spelling from MC to MAC. Reportedly, there was also a cash settlement of at least $100,000. As vintage Macintosh audio gear is so treasured, last summer I decided to add a few pieces to my collection. My requirements were that the components be in good cosmetic condition and that they at least powered up. It took a while, but in November, I discovered this ad for four Macintosh components selling for $12,000 and advertised as in mint condition and tested. I learned that the system was owned by a gentleman in Texas who had recently died. His son wrote to me that his dad, quote, babied his Macintosh and bragged about it often to anyone that would listen. Upon further investigation, I found that the equipment wasn't truly mint, but could be considered in very good condition once everything was cleaned up. Additionally, testing was only limited to confirming that the equipment powered on and produced sound. After some negotiation, I made the purchase and anxiously awaited delivery. Given the value, weight, and delicacy of the components, I was nervous about having them shipped to me halfway across the country. Many people take long trips just to pick up equipment of this type, so I fear they might arrive damaged. 
Fortunately, the sellers did an outstanding job with the packing, and all was well when I opened the boxes. There were four components, an MR71 tuner, C22 preamp, MI3 maximum performance indicator, and MC2105 amp, all which date from 1967. As expected, the equipment was dusty and had some performance issues. I cautiously used it in my system for several weeks while I gathered the components for restoration. I began by restoring the C22 preamp and then the MI3 maximum performance indicator. Both now look and perform amazingly well. In this series, I'll focus on the restoration of the MC2105 amplifier, the only component of the four that is fully solid state. The MC2105 sold from 1967 to 1977, and when mine was purchased in 1967, cost $649. Adjusted for inflation, that's about $5,000 today. The amp has a frequency response from 10 to 100,000 Hz within 3 dB, harmonic distortion below 0.25% at full power, and can easily supply 105 watts into 4, 6, or 8 ohms. It comes in at a very heavy 65 pounds. Let's get it on the bench and open it up. As you can see, I've removed the most delicate pieces from the amp and have covered the meters and transformer housings to protect them. The top and bottom of the chassis are exposed and we're ready to begin our restoration. We'll start in the next video in this series, so stay tuned. If you'd like to be updated, be sure to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell to receive notifications. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. See you soon.